Okay, hello everyone. So my name is Gail Renaud. So, so I'm going to talk today about uh, handling frequent changes in a state structure. So where do I come from? So I'm from Datadome. We're a bot detection company based in Paris, and uh, we're using Flank uh, for our uh, streaming engine uh, to handle uh, the updates to um, our model. Actually, uh, we're, we're receiving, uh, you know, HTTP requests and uh, using Flink to determine uh, to update our model to tell us whether or not uh, some uh, those requests are coming from a bot or not. Okay, so what was our problem? Uh, we're a startup and uh, we're in cybersecurity, which means uh, we do we have a pretty hectic uh, development cycle. Uh, we add new features and improvements uh, extremely frequently. Uh, like for us, uh, a week without uh, deployment in production is pretty unheard of. So usually our deployments go the way I, th I guess it goes for most of you. We cancel the job with a safe point and we redeploy the new version with a safe point and everything's fine. It's rolling. Except obviously when it's not, we deploy with a safe point and the job crashes on, uh, on restart. So what happens? So if you're here, I'm pretty sure it's something that uh, ha has happened to most of you. Uh, it's uh, the Flink exception could not restore key state backend for whatever, or could not restore state backend for whatever. So yeah, obviously your state has changed, and the new state structure is not compatible with the old state structure. You added a field or renamed something. So what can you do? Well. One of the easy thing you can do is, uh, okay, let's just drop the state and deploy from scratch. Well, that's not great because for us, it means we're going to run in a kind of a degraded mode for a while, the time for, time for us to rebuild our state. And in addition, most of the time, our upgrade is one operator. This is actually a, a quick presentation of one of our jobs in production. And yeah, when I change just one operator in that whole job, I don't want to reset the state on everything. I want to reset the state on that operator. So something I'm not going to talk, to talk about too much in this presentation is state migration. Uh, it doesn't do it, do it for us because we're mostly using cryo as a, the serialization engine and uh, the state migration doesn't handle cryo. And we could uh, transform some stuff into a Pojo, uh, in Pojo classes. But uh, Pojo migration doesn't do it for us either because uh, it doesn't handle correctly name change, for instance, between columns. Uh, it doesn't handle very well uh, new fields uh, in which uh, the default value is uh, the Java virtual machine default value, null for objects, the zero for numbers, etc. So that's not exactly what we want. And in addition, we have some classes that are just not Pojos. Okay, so what was our first solution to that? Well, it was pretty obvious. Okay, uh, we know the state is kept by a UID of the operator. So, okay, we're just going to version our UIDs. Fine. So we start doing that and uh, it's great. And a few updates later, we deploy with a safe point and uh, the, uh, the job crashes yet again. Okay, so what happened? Well, obviously we should have changed the version number. And yet, it's why didn't we change it? Well, we were just, you know, adding, a, preparing a new feature, adding a few fields on a model class, and why didn't it work? Well, I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure most of you have already guessed. Okay, right. Where we've modified a class that's used inside a class that's used inside a class that is actually the state of my function. Okay, so we should have remembered to update the version number. So starting from there, there are two ways to go. The first one is to consider you're never going to make that mistake again. You're going to be extra careful and you're always going to remember to update your version number. I don't exactly believe in human beings being able to, uh, to do something without ever making a mistake. So can we actually assume that people are going to make mistake and find some way to automate this? So our idea was, okay, let's make something that automatically change whenever the state structure changes for a function. So that, here's the example uh, we gave. So it's the 
Inside the UID, we're going to put something that's the signature of the current state structure of the function. Obviously, there's one big trade-off, uh, which is uh, it's going to, since it's automatic, sometimes we're going to change something and lose the state of a function without thinking you would, which can be a pretty big deal. So that's actually quite easy to uh, counteract. You just have to add a unit test telling you whenever a function's uh, state signature just changed just to be sure it's something you actually wanted. So, OK, how are we going to do that? We're going to use our first try was going to use type information. So type information, what is it? Uh, I think most of you have already encountered it in Flink. So it's how Flink uh, describes the serialization, deserialization information for a type. So depending on whether you're using the Scala or the Java API, in Scala, it's just implicitly available for the type you want. Uh, in Java, it's a bit more um, verbose, especially if, you have, uh, if you're using generic types. But OK, it's pretty simple. As an aside, starting with that's pretty much the only piece of Java code in the whole presentation. Most of it is actually not too complex Scala, so it can be ported to Java. But everything else is going to be in Scala. OK, so what was our idea? OK, so we have our class, uh, our, our process function, uh, with a state. And OK, we're going to define the signature for that function. Uh, so yeah, for you Java uh, Java doers out there, uh, uh, stuff in object match function is the equivalent of having a static values inside the class. Uh, so you're going to have your signature being the hash code of the type information for whatever class is used inside your state. Pretty straightforward. And the basic idea is going to be whenever you change something inside the population, even in transitive dependencies of population, it's going to change the type information, because obviously it's going to change the serialization, which means the hash code is going to change, which means the signature is going to change. And inside the job, it's going to be great. Uh, we're going to have a different um, UID. So OK, maybe we have uh, our first uh, solution here. We define a, a signature method that's going to do that for us. Again, if you don't understand exactly the, the signature of the, of, the, of the method, no big deal. Just remember, a signature of population is a short uh, shorthand for taking the type information of population and getting its hash code. So OK, what do we do with that? What, what happens in some functions when you have multiple states, either because you have a broadcast state or because you have just several states? That's fine. You can put a, you can do a, a signature for a tuple of the different states uh, you want. You start to see the first eh, stuff that's maybe a bit problematic. It's we're not exactly encoding the fact that we have in one case a value state and the other in a map state. We're just hoping that at no point we're going to replace our map state with the value state of the tuple uh, key and statistics. Usually not a big deal, but deserves to be noted. Then, OK, how does it work with generic types? Well, it looks good, actually. When you try to do the signature for a list of population and a list of person, you have two different values, as expected. So good, the input inside the list is taken into account. Even if you define yourself a generic type as a case class, it's good. You have your, uh, it looks great. Uh, you have different signatures whenever the types inside uh, is different. So that's what we did. And uh, for a while, it worked quite well for us until we had another crash on the deployment. Because, well, a change that should have been taken into account, we changed the type of, uh, of a value. Yep. So what happened? Well, actually, the, the signature doesn't work here. It doesn't work because the type information is only different when uh, it's a case class, uh, what in Java you would call a POJO. Uh, if you have a class here that's a normal class, it stops working. It stops working. So, OK, there's a workaround. We can maybe put what's inside something inside the signature itself, but we're kind of back to square one. When we change a transitive, uh, something uh, inside the, um, when we change something inside the something class, I should have named that differently actually. When we change uh, inside the something class, we need to remember to update my function, which was pretty much what we wanted to avoid. 
Okay, so let's start. Let's try something else. Let's try to realize a custom uh, type signature. So what are our requirements? So as I said before, I want to differentiate value state and list state, for instance. Uh, I want to be able to set the custom signatures because some of our types are not bojos, they're not case classes. We want to be able to write ourselves the type signature we want for those classes. And ideally, we don't want to write too much code, as usual. So, okay, can we, can we satisfy all of this? So, okay, here's the basic idea we had. On the class something, we're going to define a type signature of something. So, again, uh, in Scala, that would be a static uh, public uh, value. Public member, sorry. Uh, so, if you're going to define your type signature in something. In the function itself, uh, you're going to define, OK, I want on my function, I'm going to have a uh, type signature for the state, so a state type signature. And this time, I'm going to be a bit more explicit about what I'm doing. Instead of just passing the types, we're going to say, OK, I'm creating a state type signature specifically for a key process function. So I have to put a key and the state that's being uh, used inside. And this time, I can specify it's a list state. It's not just a type. And then, I'm so uh, this is a little more for Scala uh, users. Uh, as you may have noted, everything here is implicit. The type signature is implicit. The, sign the state type signature is implicit. And here, in we have a UID stated method. When I'm going to tell, OK, for this UID, the class I'm using, the type I'm using is my function, and it's going to implicitly load the, uh, the state type signature that's defined in my function. Uh, I'm not going to go into details about how extension methods uh, like UID stated works. Uh, you can check it for yourself, it's pretty easy. Uh, basic idea is, okay, UID cited is a method that's going to take the ID and the implicit state type signature for my function. And it's going to put a UID on the stream, which is the UID you put here, so my uh, dash function, and the hash of the uh, state type signature we described. Uh, so, OK, so we have our type signature on the type, our state type signature on, on the function, and in the job, we're using it directly. We're using just UID stated, which loads state type signature, which loads type signature. How do we build a type signature for a complex class? Well, it's Actually, sure, you have to do it manually. Uh, you're just going to tell, hey, inside this type that I'm doing that I'm doing a custom signature for, here are the list of types I'm using. If those are simple types, well, we're just going to generate automatically the type signature for them. And again, if anything changes inside one person, it's going to change the type signature of something. As I said, for simple case classes, we don't want to be to have to write everything manually. So we can just back up, have a backup as the type signature, the, what we did with the type, uh, type information. So we have a method from type info on type signature that's going to do exactly what we did before with the uh, type signature. And then to avoid having to write from type info everywhere in every custom class, we can just define a bunch of default signatures for basic types, boolean, int, long, double, string, uh, all the derived stuff, collections, tuples, etc. cetera, uh, list. Uh, I'm not going to go into the generic type signatures, but you can actually use some stuff like shapeless. Uh, at the end, I'll show you the URL to our source code. And we're actually using shapeless to generate uh, the type signature for case classes. So we don't even need to use the from type info anymore. So the way it looks like now is, well, we just, we don't even need a specific type signature for person because it's all generated in the default methods. So we have implicitly type signatures for person, for list person, from a, for tuple of person and string, etc. Okay, so to wrap it up, what do I have? I'm the, I define a type signature in the companion object of the class, which means whenever I modify the class, the type signature is just there. If it's a custom type signature, it's in the same file, just under my nose. It's easy to remember to update it. 
the function state signature is defined only from the states that's visible locally inside the function. So again, if you change something in the function, you know you need to change the state signature. If you change something in other classes, you don't have to worry about the state signature of the, the function. And you have to remember in the job definition to use the UID state met uh, method to mark the function as stateful. So if I show how it works, so we have our class something uh, where we just added uh, the field name and our class person when we added the field nickname. So what happens? Well, adding the field name here, it's good in, in uh, something is going to be taken into account in the type signature of something. Uh, adding nickname in person is going to be taken into account into the implicit type signature for person, which is in turn going to take to be taken into account into the type signature of something, which is going to ta be taken into account into function, which is going to change the UID. So any single change in, his one, in one of those classes is going to be guaranteed to change the UID of the operator. That's it. So now if you have any questions.